We are incredibly fortunate this evening. Our guest um, will be reading from her soon to be published 14th book. And yes. The book that she's com that's coming out is called Flight Behavior, and I'll let her tell you more about it, but first let me tell you something about her. She grew up exactly 36 miles from here in the 1960s and the 70s in the small town of Carlisle. And during those years, she spent a lot of time here in Lexington. Her parents were raised here. Uh, indeed, in a strange coincidence, Barbara's grandparents once lived in the very house that my family and I live in today. So I'm hoping for a little king solver dust on my <laughs> writing career. Barbara told me that as a kid when she would sometimes come to visit her grandparents here and she would go to the neighborhood, she would say, wow, this is real life. They have sidewalks. So she graduated from high school in Nicholas County, and then she earned degrees from DePaul University and the University of Arizona, and finally settled in Tucson. She took up freelance writing in 1985, and then began a career that has made her one of the most important writers of our generation. Her first novel in 1988 was The Bean Trees, and there's been a string of best-selling, award-winning novels that have followed, including Animal Dreams in 1990, the Poisonwood Bible in 1998. <laughs> you got the fans here. Yeah. Prodigal Summer in 2000 and The Lacuna in 2009. As a nonfiction writer and reader, my first King Solver experience was Animal Vegetable Miracle. And it forever changed my relationship with food. And it added a new phrase to our family lexicon. Is it local? Since I finished Barbara's book, my wife will tell you, whenever she places a meal on the table, I'll survey the various mounds and slices, and then I'll invariably point to something and gaze at her with a vague accusation. Is it local? What I love about Animal Vegetable, and indeed about all quality nonfiction, is the clarity of thought and language. After I read Animal Veg Vegetable, I chased down her other nonfiction and eventually landed on her book of essays called Small Wonder. The book was written in 2002 and was in part her reaction or response or a, attempt to make sense of 9-11 and to help others do the same. As she put it, writing that book, which was both painful and palliative for me, turned out to be my own way of giving blood in a crisis. And she's been giving blood for the last quarter century. Whether in fiction or nonfiction or poetry, everything she writes has at its core a social and humanitarian soul search. She's not only trying to entertain us, she's trying to change us. In one of her most beautiful passages of nonfiction, she reflects on the role of the writer. I quote, political urgencies come and go, but it's a fair enough vocation to strike one match after another against the dark isolation. When spectacular arrogance rules the day and tries to force hope into hiding. It seems to me that there is still so much to say that I had better raise up a yell across the fence. I have stories of things I believe in, a persistent river, a forest at the edge of night, the religion inside a seed, the startle of wing beats when the, a spark of red life flies against all reason out of the darkness. Please join me now in welcoming our match striker, our spark of life in times of darkness, our fellow Kentuckian, Barbara Kingsolver.
Well, golly, thanks. <laughs> we hardly know each other, and I already love you. You're a great audience. If I can just say book titles and, you're che and you'll cheer, that's... Uh, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm delighted to be here in my native state, which is a commonwealth. I know that. I went to seventh grade. Um, <laughs> And I'm really proud uh, and lucky to be from a place that embraces its writers with such, uh, with such love, with such genuine and earnest love. I've always felt proud to aspire to the pantheon that twinkles with stars like Wendell Berry and Harriet Arno and Bobby Ann Mason and Nikki Finney, uh, who's now a Kentucky writer. Um, but in it, it's not just a place of writers, it's a place of readers. And that's, um, that's of course, uh, the most important thing for a writer is to have readers. Without you, we are nothing. Um, I just learned maybe you've known this longer than I have, that, um, how to put this, the city that is ranked first in the nation for downloading and buying e-books is this one, Lexington, Kentucky. <laughs> Cheers for you. Seriously, and that, that is really good news because uh, ebook, I don't know if you knew this, but ebook buyers are also the demographic of people who buy the most books in all forms. So it's ebook readers tend to be omnivorous readers. Well, I'll read my phone, I don't care. <laughs> if it's got a good novel on it, I'm all over it. Um, so that, I was. I was delighted to hear that, and also kind of, it was kind of fun to read that in the New York Times, um, where it was noted with some surprise. <laughs> so, uh, if there are people out there who still think we Hill people don't know how to use technology, or don't know how to read, uh, they are now officially advised. Um, I, I, I am really happy to hear that you are aware of your status as a, you know, a, a literary and arts center of um, Middle America. And I think you probably do know how lucky you are to have so many resources in this city. The fact that you have several independent booksellers is remarkable, you know. Many cities of this size have none. You have a lot. You have. Um, good schools, good universities, good teachers, um, and you have something that nobody else has anywhere, which is the Carnegie Center. Um, hooray! It sounds like you all already are supporters of the Carnegie Center, but just in case you're not, I hope that this will be the day that you um, find out that you should go down there and uh, or go online and check out the many wonderful programs that the Carnegie Center has for uh, supporting readers and writers at every level. And uh, that's an important part of why this, this city is a book town. And I would also like to take this opportunity to, um, to thank uh, in addition to thanking Neil and all the people who've worked hard on this fabulous conference that uh, started without me, but um, I got here, I'm happy to be here as part of it. But I'd also like to thank uh, the person who was the um, backbone and the heart of the Carnegie Center for many, many years, and who is the reason I know about it, because she's a member of my family, and that's Jan Eisenhower. <laughs> I think it was Jan's last act before she <laughs> retired to invite me to come and do this, and, I'm, and I thank you for inviting me. I'm, uh, I'm proud 
to, to be here and do it. Um, a lot of people, you know, ask me, why, are there, why do you think there's so many writers from Kentucky? And I, of course, have no idea. There are many Kentuckys. I would venture to say that the Kentucky that produced Bobby Ann Mason is different from the one that produced Harriet Arno, and certainly both of those are different from the Kentucky that produced me. Um, but I can tell you that my Kentucky is, uh, was, and is uh, a place that's rich in story, um, a place where people value story and value community. And really, I think of community as a connection between people's stories and their place. And place is... Um, Place is, is powerful and distinct in the culture of, of my childhood. The part of Kentucky that I really know most intimately is uh, from, I'm going to point the wrong way, from here east. Okay, which way is east? Boy, I got four <laughs> answers to that. <laughs> east. Um, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and some of you are right. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I'm a little turned around at this. This is West May. Okay. Anyway, all right. From anyway, from here out to that pointy nose of Kentucky, um, because I live on the other side of that that pointy nose in Virginia. In when I was growing up, it seemed that our family often went into the mountains in search of. Um, uh, bird song and wildflowers and even things like hearing Jean Ritchie in a, I heard Jean Ritchie play her dulcimer in a high school gym. I heard, uh, I met Jesse Stewart when I was about eight years old and I thought, wow, a real guy wrote a book. Um, that was, that was, uh, and, and now that I live on the other side of those mountains, um, in, in Virginia, I cross those mountains quite often because of family here. And in fact, that's a journey I've made on average once a month um, for quite a while now. And you know, there are a hundred ways to cross, a hundred different routes for crossing those mountains to get from here to where I live in Virginia. And I've tried them all, and not a one of them is any shorter than any other. But what strikes me every time is the place names. You know, Hazel Green, Viper, uh, Lo sh sh what? Yeah. <laughs> um, sh uh, wait, Old, I wrote this one down the last time the, that we drove over. Old Short Fork Road, which isn't. <laughs> Um, happy. Do you know there's a happy Kentucky? Uh huh. Who's been there? All right. We. Um, that's one of our favorite routes. Takes us through happy. And when um, my kids were younger, we'd always play this game where you think of the business that you'd like to uh, own in Happy, Kentucky. They would always go for the macabre. You know, like the happy funeral home. Um, <laughs> See, I had something else in mind. I was thinking, like, the happy pharmacy. <laughs> but, right? But these are lost opportunities because, as far as I can see, none of these businesses exist in happy. I can tell you, it looks like there's a lot of happy Baptists in there. Um, um, and a post office. And um, one time we actually stopped at the post office to get a birthday card send a birthday card to my dad from there so that it would be postmarked happy. Um, and if you knew my dad, you would know why. Um, his birth certificate should be postmarked happy. Um, and you know what? It came marked hazard. <laughs> After all that, I guess they trucked the mail over to hazard. For, they probably don't have a stamp in happy. But... Um, I'm telling you, I mean, lost opportunity, right? Would, do you want to go to the hazard pharmacy? <laughs> I shouldn't say that. I'm sure there are several, and I'm sure they're very nice, but I would still drive over to Happy Pharmacy. Um, anyway, 
uh, all those roads have led me here uh, to you, and I'm supposed to be reading to you, and so I will. I'm reading from new work, I promised that, and I don't always have, well, new to you, meaning it's, I didn't write it on the drive over, uh, <laughs> uh, but meaning it's unpublished, and, you, and usually these things just, you know, they get published right after I re write them, which is unnerving. See, I like to, I would revise infinitely. If it was up to me, I'd still be working on the first novel. Because, <laughs> you know, you can still make it better. But um, as it happens, I have, uh, I have this novel that's coming out in uh, November. And I also have some poems, because poetry is something that I write just every now and then whenever I feel like it. And then when they've accumulated to a certain extent, then I'll publish a collection, which is, happens approximately once every 20 years. So um, I've been working on this collection of poems that are how-to poems. So I'm going to read you some of those. Um, it's not your conventional how-to. Well, maybe, maybe it is at your house. But just to give you an idea, the um, title is How to Fly in 10,000 Easy Lessons. So this is the, this is the title. I mean, this is, this is that one, How to Fly. Behold your body as water and mineral ash, the very same water that soon, from a tree's way of thinking, soon will be lifted through the elevator hearts of a forest offered back to the sun on leafy fingertips, and the ash, as light as snowflakes, falling on updrafts toward the open mouth of a singing bird. Behold your elements reassembled as pieces of sky, ascending without regrets, because you've been lucky enough already, fallen for the last time into a slump, the wrong crowd, love. You've made the best deal. Machu Picchu, you climbed it or you didn't. Anything left undone, you can slip like a cloth bag of marbles into the hands of a child who will be none the wiser. Imagine your joy on rising. Repeat as necessary. This is how to shear a sheep. I, I live on a sheep farm, by the way. More about that later. But this is how to shear a sheep. Walk to the barn before first light. Take off your clothes. Cast everything on the ground, your nylon jacket, wool socks, and all. Throw away the cutting tools, the shears that bite like teeth at the skin when hooves flail and your elbow comes up hard under a panting throat. No more of that. Sing to them instead. Stand naked in the morning with your entreaty. Ask them to come. Lay down their wool for love. That should work. It doesn't. This one in the in keeping with the wool uh, theme is called a Unitarian Prayer or How to Knit a Sweater. O oh Lord, whether male, female, animate, all-knowing, unreasonable, or just whether or not, we are practical people who hedge our bets. As I hold my loved ones in my thoughts today, Meditating on our hopes and cold adversities, I also hold a skein of good wool, clicking my needles like rosary beads, working through Hail Marys of knit and pearl. By involving fiber in my invocation of divinity, I feel assured 
of a fairly positive outcome. Okay, I'm covering all bases here. This is how to have a child. Begin on the day you decide you are fit to carry on. Begin with a quailing heart, for here you stand on the fault line. Begin at the beginning. Begin with your mother, with her grandfather, the ones before him. Think of their hands, all of them, on the plow, on the cradle, the rifle butt, the cheek of a lover, the frame of a door, the razor strop, the willow switch. Everything that can wreck a life has been done before, done to you even. That's all inside you now. Half of it you won't think of. The rest you wouldn't dream of. Go on. This is fun because I've, most of these I've not read aloud before, so they surprise me. Um, <laughs> this is uh, something, another hobby of mine. It's called How to Be Grateful When Your Leg is Broken. Um, that's, I've done that four times. Um, when I go on stage, you don't say to me, you break a leg. No, thank you. In fact, I think... If I remember right, the last time I gave a reading in this city, I think I was on crutches. Was he, does that ring a bell? With what? Right, with Wendell Berry. And when Wendell said, you should keep that cane, Barbara. It looks very distinguished. And I thought, no, I'll keep it because I'm going to use it again. Um, but um, recently I gave it away, so I'm t taking a walk on the wild side. Anyway, you know, you cultivate all you can... All you can uh, Control is your attitude, right? How to be grateful when your leg is broken. Be thankful you can knit bones or wool, two sticks clicking, tibia, fibula, a ribbed scarf as long as winter. The mindless tasks a body learns when it must. Praise your clawfoot tub. Tie a sheet low on its belly like a saddle on a pig. To hammock your landlocked limb while the remainder of you steeps. Sunk deep in hot water up to your chin, dream of the troubles you used to have when trouble was yours to make. The doctor says eight weeks. Spend seven here. <laughs> Be glad for your cast, which draws children with permanent markers like vandals and their graffiti to the dullest walls and blighted parts of town. They mark out their loves and territories, and you, the benevolent mayor, will wear these concerns in public, then throw them away when your term is up. Hail the song of gratitude that will blow like Gabriel's horn when you next dance through your house with a broom and dustpan, captive no more to the refuse that closes in like the walls of Jericho. Give thanks for life's grammar, even as it nailed you in one fell stroke from subject to object. Praise the helping verbs, family hands that tote and feed, the surgical modifiers that pin you from shattered to fixed to mended. Praise the sloppy, forgiving syntax of a life in which, through steady misuse, a noun grows feet and charily one day, while no one is looking, steps out as a brand new verb. Okay, I think this is the last how-to poem uh, that I'll read tonight, and it's called How to Survive This. O oh, misery, O oh, life, imperfect universe of days stretched out ahead, O oh, string of pearls and drops of venom along the spider's web, losses of heart, 
of life and limb, news of the worst. Bear me now in mind that even so, the day will come when I look back flabbergasted at the waste of sorry salt when I had no more than this to wail about. Now I lay me down. I'm not there yet. Um, I'm going to read one more poem, which isn't new. It's, um, it's been around a while, but I want to read it for my daughter, Lily, because she's here. And she, she, I don't, I, I almost, I never write about real people in my fiction, um, and more about that later too, but poems sometimes are about people. And this one is about Lily, who's 15 now, but at one time, you would not believe it to look at her, but at one time she was 10 months old. And, um, would stand in the crib, you know, holding the bars like, you know, the prison that it was. Um, and uh, I just felt for her, you know, I just, I had such empathy for that feeling of wanting to do a million more things than you actually can. So this is, uh, and, and Lily um, agrees now that this poem says something about her that, um, well, I think that we all understand, but that is in some ways still true. It's, uh, it's called Baby Blues for Lily on the Verge. Look at me, my dark scarlet heart disguised in pink. I am, look at me. Oh, I'm the pure blue force of want howling through thin walls like a prairie wind. I am so large and empty. Why did the Cheerios stick to the backs of my hands? When I push the bear through the bars, why is it gone? I want that bear. I want, oh, listen, the jingle shudder of ears getting up, the dog, oh, come, 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 gone. I want that dog. Oh, keep your pastel colors. Boredom is a purple need. Hunger is vermilion. I want my dark blue heaven milk mother mother, but the minute I fall into darkness, she puts me down. They do. They put you down. The big ones only want one thing, to leave you alone. You have to stay awake, see? The big ones are my shepherd, and I shall want, with the pure blue force of a howling wind, I want the dog, the bear, the milk, I want every Cheerio that fell on the floor, I want the brightest colors all pressed hard against my gums, I want the world, and it will not fit in my mouth. Okay, now um, I'm going to read, as promised, from this book that's so new it doesn't exist yet, except this is um, this magical thing that's called an advanced reading copy that goes to reviewers and such. So it's sort of in the world, but it will be in, really in the, it'll be published and available in one of your wonderful independent bookstores on November 4th. And I'm going to be back in town uh, in November, um, uh, and probably lots before that, because I like this town. But um, this, and I don't want to tell you a whole lot about it because, well, um, because I wouldn't know where to begin. You know, that's the heart when they be when you finish a novel and then you start doing interviewers and the interview interviewers invariably ask you okay now that you've spent years on these big ideas you know developing these and finessing and nuancing these ideas that seem like the most large and inconquerable and important ideas in the world then someone sits down and clips a mic to your lapel and says what's your book about and they want, you know, a 50-second answer. I just think, well, don't ask me. You know, I'm the verbose one. 
is about 500 pages long, right? Uh, read it. Um, but, you know, of course, of course, I don't say that. I'm a polite Kentucky girl, so I make something up, um, something or other. But it's about, I will tell you, um, it's about denial and belief and how we can all look at the same set of facts and come away believing different things. Um, and it's set in a rural place um, that could be Kentucky or could be southwestern Virginia or could be Tennessee. Um, it's set in a, on a farm, on a sheep farm, in fact. And that was a fun thing about this book is that um, I, I live on a farm. We have about 40 head right now of sheep. And when you are, one thing about farming is that you learn to do things you never thought you are going to have to learn to do because, you know, they have to be done. I, I feel badly. The sun is in your eyes, isn't it? Anyone who would like to, is there a way anyone can move or we just um, trust the sun will move? <laughs> anyway, if you need to shuffle around, please don't feel badly. I understand. You're not hiding your eyes from me. Um, oh, yeah, farming. And um, we, we, where we live, which is like many rural places, a vet, you know, is, is hard to get. When, um, usually, the vet really won't come until your, your livestock are, you know, whatever. I mean, the livestock vets. Uh, it's hard to get someone to come out unless your animal is about 15 minutes from death's door. And it takes them 30 minutes to get there. So it's kind of a losing proposition. So over the years, uh, we ha we have learned, I, I end up usually, I mean, my husband does, is, is um, he, he, does, he does so much work with those animals, but usually when it comes to what, those ginchy things, he's holding the other end, and <laughs> I'm delivering the breech lamb, um, which actually happened this spring, and so we do our own, um, we do the, we inoculate them, and we worm them, and we um, do uh, this thing to the little boys that makes them grow up just as sweet. <laughs> uh, if, you, if you ladies are wondering about my secret, I could tell you it's a little bitty rubber band about this big. Um, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, that's the ice break moment. Um, so anyhow, one, uh, and you know, you read the veterinary manuals to try to be prepared, but you can never really be prepared. But there was this one thing that I had read in the veterinary manual um, years ago, uh, having to do with resuscitation of a, of, a, of a lamb that's born not breathing. And I, re I remember reading it and thinking, <clears throat> I'm never going to do that. Um, and sure enough, I, I did. Um, because when you have to do these, you know, life, life is what it is. It throws things in your face and you do things that you thought you wouldn't do. So, um, and uh, I don't want to blow the surprise because it's in, but, but when this happened, it was, it's sort of a very strange and remarkable, unexpected thing to do to a newborn lamb. And so people told me, when I told friends that, this, that I'd done this odd resuscitation maneuver, they said, oh, you'll, oh, you'll put that in a novel. Well, I don't know who, I don't know how many writers we have here, presumably a lot, but, you know, people, th people say that about everything. Like, I'll get home from the shoe store with two left shoes by accident, and people say, oh, you'll put that in a novel. Well, no, <laughs> I won't. <laughs> and and I, I, don't, I don't put the realities of my life in a novel. I never write about my friends or my family because I want them to remain my friends and my family. <laughs> and, um, and furthermore, writing fiction isn't like that. It's not that you just string real things together until you have enough of them and then you turn it in. It's, it's not a string of people and it's, a novel is not a string of incidents. It's a string of meanings. It's, it's incident invested with meaning. So I can't put something that really has happened in a novel until I understand what it means. And then 
maybe it will have a place. Um, usually it becomes transformed, but the important part is the meaning. So anyway, the strange resuscitation maneuver I figured out. I, I realized what it meant. So to my surprise, it did end up in the novel. So it's always hard to pick some little passage um, to read, but this this one was picked for me. Actually, a, a magazine chose this as a as an excerpt to run, and I thought, oh, how how perfect! And surprisingly, it's the beginning of the last chapter, and I don't want and it. Oddly, it doesn't really give away any, there are some important surprises in this novel that I don't want to tell you about, uh, just in case you want to read it for yourself. But um, as it happens, I thought, this is a good little passage to read um, that has the surprising lamb maneuver in it. So um, it, this is the beginning of chapter 14. And so see all this, nothing's happened yet that I have to tell you about. Uh, <laughs> Um, really all you need to know is that the, the main character is a young farm wife named Della Robia. She has two uh, preschool children named Preston and Cordelia, and her husband is Cub, um, and her best friend is Dovey, and that's, that's all you need to know. And the dog is Roy. Okay, you've got it. So this is the, ba the beginning of chapter 14, per Perfect Female. At some unmeasured moment, the temperature fell through the floor and the rain turned crystalline, descending noiselessly in the dark and stunning Delarobia the following morning when she let Roy out the front door. Snow. Roy bounded wolfishly through the white deep, nosing into drifts, leaving a tangled line of tracks as he hurried to put his small yellow tags on all the yard's most notable points the dog version of post-its. <laughs> the cedars in the cook's front yard were flocked with white, and their holly tree was enveloped in ice, giving the effect of a commemorative Christmas plate. The big maple on the property line was less enchanting as it dropped limbs onto the driveway at steady intervals, crash, crash, like an angry drunk. Needless to say, school was canceled. Dovey called around eight to report she hadn't even gotten halfway to cash club before she had to turn around. The way she described the cars sliding around on Highway 7 sounded like a slow-motion automotive ballet. This is so whack, Dovey said. Who ever heard of a winter like this? Nobody, Delarobia replied. She couldn't stay away from the front window. Everything looks so clean and transformed, so fresh start. All ramshackle aspects of the neighborhood's houses and barns had disappeared under white roofs against white fields. The mailbox sported a white toupee. Icicles fringed the entire roof line, the massive one down at the end unfortunately suggesting a backed-up gutter. It was three feet long and curved slightly outward like a movie villain's sword, just dangling. The icicle of Damocles. Don't you walk under that thing, she warned Preston. From the couch, Preston shot back a look that said, no chance. He and Cordy were snuggled under blankets in their pajamas watching cartoons. They'd waited all winter for this. A snow day was not to be wasted. Delarobia moved to the kitchen windows to stare out in a new direction while she made hot chocolate for the kids. She stood watching the sh oh, even a field of mud and sheep droppings could be rewritten as a clean slate. She stood watching the sheep, which seemed undismayed by the dazzling ground. Cub had made a brief early trudge to the barn to feed hay, and now they wandered out over the white land to chew their cuds. Their pointed feet broke through the crust, and they lurched along, dragging broad, pregnant bellies, leaving the oddest imprint on the snow, like the trail of a dragged sandbag punctuated with holes. Their wool colors stood out sharply, the blacks and murets especially, but even the white sheep against the blazing snow looked yellowish, the color of actual rather than commercial teeth. Most of the sheep were standing, she discerned, though their legs were invisible, 
but a few had knelt down into, the little, into little snow bowls to rest placidly in the glare of a new kind of day. Very high on the hill, one coal-black ewe was lying down oddly with her nose up, like a seal balancing a ball, that color and that posture, her nose sticking straight up in the air. Cub, Delarobia called, come here a minute. Cub padded into the room in his socks, agreeable and in no hurry. He was watching cartoons with the kids. What? Take a look at that you up near the fence, that black one that keeps arching her neck. You see her? After a moment, Cub did. I think she's in labor. It's too early, Cub said. I know it is, but she's acting weird. As they watched, she struggled to her feet and shook the snow off her wool, an impressive muscular shudder even from a distance. She turned several times in a small circle like a dog preparing to lie down, and then lay down. Once again, her nose lifted in a great arcing sweep like a circus seal, like an exercise video for livestock, an unconventional move by any standard. It's too early, Cub repeated, and it's colder than heck out there. Delarobia blew out air through her lips. I'm not asking if this is convenient. She turned off the burner under the pan of milk, which had scalded while she wasn't looking. Fix the kids some hot chocolate and give them breakfast. I'm going up there. She rushed to pull on warm layers and waterproof layers and lace up her boots, noting that Cub had ignored instructions and gone back to watching the backyardigans with a blanket pulled around everything but his face, just like the kids. Delarobia stomped out the back door and was amazed once again by the made-over world. It was abnormally quiet outside, as if sound itself had been blanketed and extinguished. Under her boots, it made a squeaky crunch. She took the hill at an angle because straight up was out of the question, she discovered, after slipping several times onto her knees. She set her feet perpendicular to the grade and made broad switchbacks up the pasture. The black ewe, when Delarobia attained her altitude, was lying in the same spot. From the looks of the wallow she'd made in the snow, she had been at this project for a while, whatever it might be. She looked glassy-eyed and bored, staring ahead, only mildly perturbed by Delarobia's sudden arrival. So what's up, lady? The dark lady turned her nose away, checking out Delarobia through the horizontal pupil of one pale amber eye. Her breath clouded the air in quick, visible puffs. You're not making my day here, you know that? After two or three minutes, Delarobia felt ridiculous. The ewe uttered a low, productive belch and began to chew her second time around breakfast in the most normal fashion known to sheep. Delarobia backed off ten paces down the hill, then ten more, in case the ewe was faking her out. The cold caught up to her when she stood still, racking her with hard shivers that rattled her teeth. You couldn't do this in the barn, could you? she asked. The sheep did nothing helpful. She even stopped chewing. Delarobia's eyes wandered up the mountain to the flocked forest, the hummocks of branches and glittery ice-enclosed twigs like glass straws. It couldn't even be a, called a freak storm. Probably there was no such thing in a freak new world of weather. Three days ago, it had been 50 degrees. The springtime smell of mud was a clear memory. The ewe called her attention back with a strange high grunt and pointed her nose again. She was on the small side, this ewe, maybe a first-timer, probably clueless and going into panic mode. The ewe stood up, shuddered, took a couple of steps forward, and out dropped something from her backside. A dark liquid puddle, really it had poured out, fluid or blood, Delarobia felt a restriction of vessels in her chest as she scuttled back up the hill, scrambling to recall words from the vet book she and Preston had at first read so carefully, but lately neglected. Amniotic sac, placenta, 
She dropped to her knees in the snow and bellowed to see a lamb, black, strangely flat against the snow, unmoving inside its translucent sack, a tiny sheep child. The ewe walked away from it and nosed into the snow, looking for graves. Yelling for cub, Dalarobia ran and slid down the hill in a direct path for the back door. Amazingly, he appeared there. She sat on her cold bottom, panting, still 50 feet or more from the house. Get up here, she yelped. Get that bucket in the barn, the emergency stuff. No, bring towels and hot water. No, bring that hot milk on the stove. What's going on, he asked. Damn it, cub, just do it. She rolled onto her knees and clambered back up the slick path she'd just compressed, a perfect sledding route. Without ever fully gaining her feet, she made it back to the puddle of lamb, swearing at the mother that stood blandly chewing now, some distance away from this thing that had definitely not happened to her. Delarobia flung off her gloves and touched the dark creature. Its heat shocked her, the warmth of the place it slid out of one minute ago. She unwound her wool scarf and scrubbed the lamb out of the milky call, then cleared its eyes and nostrils, but it was not breathing. It was limp as a rag when she lifted it, legs dangling. Delarobia shut her eyes tightly so tears wouldn't freeze in them. It looked like a toy with big Yoda ears, the legs and tender hooves perfectly formed, the body covered with glossy black curls. She'd never known Cub could move so fast. Huffing loudly, he came, with kitchen towels slung over his shoulder, hustling sideways up the hill, carrying her revereware pot by its handle, the milk. By some miracle, he stayed upright with that. She ran the last few paces to meet him and grabbed the pan and towels. The milk was still very warm. What other man would do just as she commanded, no questions asked? She felt overwhelmed with love and loss while she sopped a towel in the warm milk and watched Cub see the lamb, watched his face fall open like a glove compartment, helplessness and sorrow jammed inside. She could lose her nerve again. She always did. I don't know, Cub. I don't know, she kept repeating. Her mother-in-law had predicted she would fail at this, helping with the lambing. She rubbed the little ringlet-covered body, scrubbing hard like shining up the kids after their baths, warming this corpse with the soaked towel and then with her own breath. She blew into its tiny, damp nose, then compressed the small belly, feeling for life, but felt nothing and nothing. The small head lolled, no hint of resistance. The body was already starting to go cold. Don't you dare die on me! Damn it! She wound a dry towel around the hind legs for a grip. It was so very slippery and staggered to her feet. Okay, she said to Cub. Okay, watch out, stand back. She stomped out a tiny arena in the snow and spread her boots wide and began to turn, gaining traction as she could, swinging the lamb in a circle. By the third revolution, it flung out like a girl's ponytail on the merry-go-round. She felt liftoff. Its small weight pulled as she turned and kept turning, mindless of her own voice as she thrummed out a pulse of curses. Breathe, damn it, damn it, damn it, come on, breathe. When she fell on the ground, the world kiltered on its axis. The boughs of the forest behind her lurched, blackish and mossy looking. The sun creeping up behind them was a crystalline brightness popping and shimmying through the branches. Delarobia, what in the hell? Cub asked finally. Or she finally understood what, she, what he was asking. He was beside her on his knees. She sat up. Here, put it against your skin to warm it up. Cub unzipped his jacket and thrust the lamb under his sweatshirt, wincing only slightly at its slimy chill. He held it there. Oh my God, Cub, where are the kids? They're fine. The stove's off. They're watching TV. Did you tell them not to get off the couch? Was Cordy eating anything? They're fine, he repeated. Delarobia fell back against the snow. 
a snow angel waiting for the crazy world to give her an all clear for landing. Shortly, she sat up again. Let me see it, she said. He extracted the limp thing and she held it close to her face, watching. Cub, his heart is beating, I swear to God. Faint and fast, a pulse fluttered through the damp, curved belly against her cold hand. No muscle tone, no flicker of eyelids, no sign of life but that pulse. She stuck her index finger down its throat and scooped at a viscous phlegm that completely filled the narrow, serrated shaft of the little gullet, expelled by centrifugal force, just as the book had said. She felt the sandpaper texture of its tongue. Faintly, it pulled against her finger, suckling. Delarobia exhaled a loud cry that could have passed for either pain or laughter. She rewrapped the hind legs in the towel and got up to swing it again. This time they both shouted, Cub begging her to stop, but she didn't. Even though this flinging felt murderous to a mother who'd cradled feeble infant necks and sheltered soft fontanelles. Delarobia felt reckless, turning and turning, swinging that child until she lost her feet again. She lay panting. Cub looked both outraged and deeply anxious, basically positive that she'd lost her mind. Go call your mother, she said. Ask her what to do if a lamb's born not breathing. Jesus, Delarobia, what are you doing? I don't know what I'm doing. Just go, she screamed. Cub fled. Delarobia massaged the little body again, noticing it was a female, then tucked it under her shirt and lay back down until the worst of her dizziness passed. It seemed fully possible she might kill something here. She sat up and cradled it in both hands, watching. Faintly, it moved, moved, the narrow head lifting at an angle, tilting the outsized ears. She listened to its belly and could faintly hear breathing, not wheezy like a croup, but stuffy like a head cold. She blew into the nostrils and pressed the belly again and again, compelled by the near sensation of breath. She rubbed and massaged and warmed it until Cub returned and collapsed beside her. Mother says if there's no sign of life when it comes out, it's dead. You came back up here to tell me that. <laughs> Ask what she said. She says, lay it in the straw with the mother in the barn. If you let it be dead with the you a while, that helps them some way. Delarobia glared. Helps who? I don't know. I'm sorry. Cub retreated to the familiar grounds of remorse and insufficiency, the terms of his existence ratified by marriage. He could construct defeat from any available material and live inside it. But for once, Delarobia didn't go there with him. She found that she could not abandon the effort. Accepting death, she'd done that. But here was another story, bringing life in. Not goodbye, but hello. Screaming it, please. She massaged the dark, curly hide until her own knuckles glowed red against it, and when she paused, the lamb tried to lift its head again. It opened its eyes and looked out. Life arrived. There was so much to do. Get it warm, get it to nurse, make the mother accept it. She told Cub to go get grain and lead the mother into the barn while she warmed up the lamb in the house. They would milk that stupid ewe right now because the colostrum was crucial. They had a bottle somewhere. How did you know? Cub kept asking her. She told him she wasn't really sure how she knew. Reading, filing stuff away, or just guessing if that was the only choice. She and Preston had read about, the swinging, ar about swinging around a newborn lamb, but never in a million years did she think, She'd actually do that. Things look impossible when you've not done them. She pulled away in order to look her husband in the eye. So many things look impossible, Cub, but you still have to do them. 
They found their feet and edged down the precarious slope to their separate tasks, with the lamb cradled inside her coat. Delarobia followed the fence line for something to hang on to. She thought of the time she'd walked this fence with Cub, tearing out honeysuckle and briars to mend it. But the weeds were still here, it was plain to see, encircling the whole pasture, threaded through wire and post and skeletal trees. With their glassy stems encased in ice, the weeds looked more substantial than the fence itself. The seasons of secret growth revealed in a sudden disclosure of terrible, cold beauty. Thank you.